North Hard Street in Sabana, Ohio. This day, June 16, 1993. We're going to be talking about the businesses and the businessmen and women that worked and owned the stores in Sabana in 1930, give or take a year or two. I won't guarantee that I'm 100% correct in what I'm going to be talking about, but I, I feel assured that I'll be at least 95% correct. Alongside me, taking the pictures, a man that's lived in Sabana his whole life, and nobody loves this town more than he does, Terry Moore. But Terry, if you'll swing over and take a shot of this vacant lot. It, the building that was there in 1930 has been torn down. It was the first store on the east, west side of Howard Street, the north side of town, first building south of the tracks. Melvin Stover had a seed store here in this first building. Then the second building, I should, can you cut that back? But before we go to the next building, I, I, I want to mention Melvin Stover and his family. Uh, they lived uh, two streets north of the tracks on the east side of Howard Street. Uh, he and Mrs. Stover, and they had one son, Bob, who was a well-known trombone player. He was the first trombone player in, in a high state marching band, and he played in a lot of dance bands for years around the Midwest. Okay, now the next building, Cherry, is still standing, 1930. This, this room was a grocery store owned and operated by Ed Beck. It was one of the most interesting grocery stores I've ever been in. He didn't uh, stock many staples, it was specialty items. Specialty spices and, and fruits. And all. It, was a, it was a very interesting place. Ed Beck was in this room for a long time. And now the next building has again been torn down. You're going to hear this all afternoon, I'm afraid, because many of the old buildings that were here in 1930 are long gone. All right, the business here in this vacant lot in 1930 was two rooms. It was a very large hardware store owned and operated by Cliff Light. Both the rooms, as you see, are gone. And after the, the, the hardware store going south, we come to a vacant alley. And if you pan over towards that fence, Terry, that alley was just the side of the fence. And <clears throat> south of the alley, the first room was the United States Post Office here in Sabina. And I had an uncle that carried rural mail, carrier, carried mail for more than 40 years. And he was a pretty well-known baseball player, Willis Hieronymus. And when I was a little guy, <clears throat> about two or three times a summer, <clears throat> excuse me, he uh, offered me a new baseball if I'd be at the post office uh, when he got there. Well, he'd get there at six o'clock in the morning but I'd always be there at five o'clock in the morning, waiting for him to come with that new baseball. The other well-known mail carriers of that day were Dale Adams and William Marsh. We'll go right on, Terry down, adjacent to the, the post office. The next room was a restaurant, a small restaurant, uh, counter type, no tables, owned and operated by Harry Kahn. He, uh, he, I think, was in the food business someplace in Ohio his whole life. He was, he was elderly man at this time, but he had a knack of making the best homemade soups I've ever eaten. The next building after Harry Kahn, of course, this is all now blacktop, owned by Mac Tool. But the next room after. Harry Kahn's restaurant was Frank Grove's drugstore. 
Now Frank was a great baseball fan and he had a real old-fashioned drugstore. I, I remember it very well. In his first showcase he had autographed baseballs by some of the the greatest baseball players that ever played the game. Ty Cobb and Honus Wagner and Babe Ruth and all of them and I've often wondered whatever happened <laughs> to those baseballs that Frank Grove owned. owned. After the uh, the drugstore then of course I spent a lot of time in this next room. My dad had his International Harvester farm equipment store in this room and it's part of the, the vacant lot now and my dad was in business here in Sabina from 22 until he passed away in 54 in the farm implement business. He was in this room I guess six or eight years maybe I don't recall. Right in this area here? Right here in this area right here just about due west of where you're looking right now. Next to that was a small home that stood back of the street sidewalk, maybe 20 feet. And a Mr. and Mrs. Hire lived there. And they were in business uh, as used furniture dealers. And they lived and operated their business right in this little home uh, that went right up to the the red building that stands today. <clears throat> they had a son, Lowell Hire, and he was the first radio professional in, in Sabina. When radio came out in about 1923, he made his first radio sets, and of course everybody in town uh, <laughs> would uh, go to his house and listen to the radio, and he made radios for people. And in later years, he became very professional in the repair of electronics. Years later he moved to Wilmington a little higher. Now this this building is still standing. In 1930 it was a men's store on the first floor. Charlie Davis. Charlie was <laughs> one of the characters of Sabina. You know, there were about seven mail trains that went through Sabina every day. And Charlie would never didn't have a post office box. That would cost a couple dollars a month or something, but he'd go to the post office, which is just about six door, doors down from where his business was. And he'd go in after every mail train. That meant seven times a day. And each time that he went past my dad's store, he'd open the door and leave it open, or he'd close the door and leave it closed. <laughs> <laughs> he, he'd, he'd make my dad so mad sometimes. <laughs> well, <clears throat> that was in the th <clears throat> in 30. A few years later, Earl um, Atkins was a tailor. And he, on the second floor, if you want to show that up top, he had his tailor shop above Charlie Davis's men's store, and then a few years after that, it became known as the Davis Atkins fur er, Furnishing Men's Furnishings. All right, then we come to the little street that leads back now to Mac Tool. My dad was in a building at the end of the street before he moved up on Howard Street in the mid-twenties, and it was the first room of Mac Tool. It was a concrete block building owned by uh, Abe Stone. Abe owned the little building and rented it to my dad, and then when Mac Tool started, they, they uh, rented from a a Abe Stone at that time. Of course, years later, they tore it down and built many new buildings. This next building is one of the Pioneer families of Sabina. Uh, I don't recall too much in this of this business. It was going out of business in a few years when I was old enough to know what was going on. But it was for many, many years uh, a men's store. Patty, Patsy Curran, P.J. Curran, 
and he died uh, sometime in the mid 20s but his son Walter operated it as a man store in 1930 and, and a few years after that but uh, this is a three-store building Patsy Kern was well-known businessman around here in the late 19th century and the early 20th century and uh, Walter operated this maybe up until the mid 30s and then he moved to Greenfield and become a known well-known businessman down there lived down there uh, for many years Benny I'll just step out here and get a shot of this because okay. it's rare that you see a three-story building in right. this size community okay all right sir you go right ahead Very unique building, I'd say. One of a kind, and he had a wonderful store. He sold the best men's suits that money could buy in those days. And uh, he was quite a merchandiser and a good citizen. Okay, the next room was one of my favorite room of businesses in Savannah. Of course, in 1930, there wasn't, there, there wasn't much uh, tractor power on the farms. Everything was being farmed by horses and horses, of course. So this was a leather store. The Sparks Brothers had uh, harness and all types of harness equipment for horses. And they also had a big business in shoe repair. Dana and Charlie Sparks. Now the next door this room following Sparks's there was a, a jewelry store in here and this is the one or two locations on Howard Street that I cannot recall the name I'm sure some people, after they see this film, will, will give us the name of the jewelry store here. Okay, Terry. We now come to a, a vacant lot. But back in 1930, there was a lovely home in this site owned by George Maddox. George and Mrs. Maddox had one daughter, Carlene. They're all gone now. The home was lovely. It was one of the better homes, I felt, but it, I guess, was, hadn't been taken care of in recent years and they've torn it down. This next building is one of the, one of the two or three finest homes in Sabina. In 1930, it, Lou Robinson and his wife lived here. I don't recall who built it. Maybe they did, I don't know. Mrs. Robinson was, uh, was quite a lady. <laughs> she never stepped out of her house in the summertime without her parasol and her white gloves. She was always dressed in the latest of fashions. And Lou, when Lou uh, Robinson was a good friend of my dad's and he, he spent a lot of time just sitting around in my dad's store. They were nice people. What did he do, Lou? Well, he came here from Cincinnati, Terry, and I don't know. I wish I did know. Never did know what he, they were re retired when I oh. was old enough to know. Okay. But uh, somebody will have that answer, I'm sure. The next door room was a very good one. It was one of the nicest bookstores in this part of the, of the Southwestern Ohio, Howard Curtis run this drugstore. 
and he had a full line of school books and a full line of the bestsellers and just history and just about everything that a good bookstore would have, he had it. He, of course, is one of the sons of the, uh, of the pioneers of Savannah, the, Hain, or the Curtis family. Uh, Curtis's and Haines's and there are several families that have been around Savannah for, well, from almost uh, day one. This next storeroom was run by a well-known family. This is Clint Shoop's butcher shop. Clint uh, and his wife Blanche, they lived out on North Howard Street close to the Brooklyn Bridge. They had two, son two children, Walter and Lucille. Walter was a well-known musician. He, uh, I expect, had an engagement uh, 300 days a year for his whole entire life. He was an excellent piano player and an excellent accordion player. A good a good entertainer. Lucille, of course, was well known around uh, Sabina and she married L.B. Mills sometime after 1930. I don't recall exactly the year. This has always been a residence here. <laughs> I've never known who lived here. Don't know today. But it's an old home kept up in pretty good repair, uh, but I never knew who, who lived here. The first door room past the residence in 1930 was another restaurant run by Charlie Rockhold. Now Charlie had worked with Perry Webb across the street in the restaurant for several years, and, but he wanted to have his own business. And he had it here for a few years, and then he was offered a position in Washington Courthouse as a manager of the Anderson restaurants, and he spent his whole life working over there until he passed away. So, I've eaten many a meal in here, many, many, many times. The next room was one of our most more popular grocery stores. We had several. All of them very good. This was the Had College grocery store. Ed had uh, a full line of groceries and he had, he had a knack of hiring good people. Many people around here today remember Zesto Rocco. Zesto Rocco old, uh, worked for Had his, I think his whole life. He worked in the store and then he delivered groceries. People would come in and buy the groceries and have Esto or they'd call in and Esto would deliver them. The next door room after the Collett Grocery was the John Spurgeon Pharmacy. Spurgeon's Pharmacy. It was uh, a drugstore for a long time. I don't recall who came here in the 50s but somebody uh, it was a pharmacist, maybe Terry knows. You remember Paul? Paul Downs. That's right. That's in 30, it was uh, the Spurgeon Pharmacy. Now we come to a lot of vacant lots here, and a new bank building, and then from here to the... Okay, we got a lot of blacktop here now, and a very large bank that wasn't here in 1930. Terry has just suggested that we move across the street so that we, you can get a better view. Maybe we should have started right from the first on uh, across the street, but we won't do that. We're not going to do that over. But if you'll pardon us for a minute, we're going to walk across the street and show you what's standing here now. We're going to start down there at the far end where we first started. And we're going to bring you right up to where we left off at give you the opportunity to see all the buildings that's standing today and on the way up we filled in, Beanie filled in with uh, vacant lots where there used to be businesses uh, several years ago but we want to give you the view of downtown today as well
Okay, Beanie, we're right here at this lot right here now, right next to where uh, Spurgeon's, Spurgeon's uh, drugstore was. So right. we're at the vacant lot now. Right. Okay. The first space in the blacktop, there was a little house, a little home that stood back maybe 25 to 30 feet from the sidewalk owned by the Pettiford family. And Mr. Pettiford was a black man and he was a black barber. I would guess that in uh, 1930, maybe 20% of our population in Sabina were black people and they were all great. We never had any racial problems. They were good, solid citizens. Pettiford family were well respected one of the daughters became a nicely known speaker. Very intelligent people. Next to the Pettiford home was a you swing over a little bit to the left. There was a small restaurant there. And I, I'm going to guess with you now in 1930, there were two different people that owned it. And I can't tell you which one it was in 1930. But it could have been either Jeff Shadley or Brownie DeBoer. Jeff Shadley was the son of uh, Mr. and Mrs. Charlie Shadley. Had a large family and they were just uh, solid citizens. Brownie DeBoer owned the movie here in Sabina from about 1919 or 20. Uh, and then he got out of that and, and had a restaurant here for a few years. And he later, he and his family moved to Detroit. Following uh, the little restaurant, about where that sign is, the Sabina Bank, uh, we had a, another butcher, uh, Jess Sears. And uh, I'm, I'm incorrect, Terry. I'm in control. I'm wrong. Can we back up? We can't back this thing up, huh? Well, I'll just explain yeah, to you. That's yeah, that's all right. After after the little restaurant, it, <laughs> I, I was mistaken. The largest store in Sabina stood next to this little restaurant. It was E.A. Thornhill and Son. E.A. Thornhill had a very large department store, and it later become uh, half of it my dad's business and half of it Kurt Rankin's restaurant. But in 1930, it was, it was Thornhill's department store, this might be something that many of you have not heard. Forrest and Mrs. Thornhill, no, I don't mean Forrest, EA and Mrs. Thornhill and their son Forrest in 1898 took their bicycles and bicycled to that, California. I think it took them almost a year. They come back by train, but I remember Forrest telling the story many, many times of bicycling to California. Now after the Thornhill department store and became Jess Sears Meat Market. Jess was a, a butcher and uh, was around Savannah a long time. After the after the uh, the meat market, it came uh, the Savannah Bank. It only at that time it only took up about a, a fourth of what stands there today, but. Uh, George Gray was president of the bank at that time, and uh, it was a good little bank, and still is a very good bank. After the bank come an ice cream parlor. John Alferis had an ice cream parlor. This will give you an, a better view of the Sabina Bank. The brick wall that you're seeing now was uh, the front of the bank in the 1930s. Then where the glass front is now was the ice cream parlor. They had the, the little ice cream tables and chair, white chairs and, and they made wonderful ice cream. The next room was the last. Okay, Terry, uh, here on the corner, uh, it's the last building on Howard Street before you get to Elm was a grocery store 
at least 60 years that I'm sure of, and maybe 75. Howard Martin was in here in the 30s and 40s, and, and uh, about. Go ahead. About 1948, uh, Hugh Zimmerman moved into town, he and his wife Charlotte, and they had this uh, grocery store for many years. Hugh uh, and, and Charlotte had um, two or three children, I can't recall, Terry. Two children? Two. Yeah. And, uh, Dimey and Nora. Right, right. Dimey was wasn't around very long. He died as a young, very young man. Nora still lives here in Sabina. All right, let's cross the street then, Terry. Okay. You're looking now at another black top lot and automobile. 1930, it was a barber shop. I believe it was operated by Hudson, Walter Hudson. All the way down Elm Street on South side, there were several business rooms that was owned by Rod Thorpe, and uh, he had them rented most of the time. There were all types of stores. I uh, remember Needle Point store. And I don't recall Kramer all. Kramer Station. Kramer Station was to the left. Yeah. Right next between the Opera House and uh, the Barber Shop. Now, in 1930, I can't be sure who operated it. Miss mm -hmm. Faye Wilson had a creamery there at one time and then she had a creamery across the street. So it could have been her in 1930, but I don't recall what year she moved across the street. But that's, um, that was all that was on this corner, a barber shop and a creamery before we get to the, the big structure of Sabina, the opera house. Built in, I believe, 1882 or three. I was in the last class to graduate from Sabina High School from the Opera House in 1934. I recall from about 1928 to 34 uh, of seeing several vaudeville shows here, but nothing like my parents seen here because a, a good show that would go to Cincinnati and play uh, uh, undetermined number of nights, maybe one or maybe three weeks. Normally when they were through in Cincinnati they would go to Columbus and open the same show in Columbus. And the natural way to go is right from through Sabina, the old 3C highway. And of course it was all horse and wagons. It would take them a day to get here. And they'd stay at the Rap House that night and put on a show here at the Opera House. Some of the greatest entertainers the turn of the century played in this this opera house for my day, but 